So, India, subcontinent of China, um, or subcontinent of Asia. Um, in the north, in this region, you have the Himalaya Mountains, um, which have basically acted as a protective barrier to different invaders over time from the northern areas of China. Um, Mount Everest is located in the Himalaya Mountains in this northern region. Um, and Mount Everest is the highest mountain in the world at over 29,000 feet. Um, also, uh, in the north, its neighbors are Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, and Tibet. Um, Tibet's high terrain limits agriculture primarily due to um, the mountainous terrain. Some hardy vegetables can grow, but there is limited rainfall in this uh, area. The other countries surrounding India are, I don't know if you can see it. are Bangladesh to the east and Sri Lanka in the north. So um, between the eastern and western parts of northern India and Pakistan is the Indus River. Um, and you should be able to see the Indus Well, there it is right there. The Indus River um, empties into the Arabian Sea and um, this Indus River is basically the start of the earliest civilizations in India. So, um, India's history is ages and ages old, going back to the first traces of human culture and the birth of religions and the rise and fall of several great civilizations. Um, there is evidence from the earliest times of movements of people across South Asia, sometimes replacing existing populations and even integrating with these populations. Um, but of all the Europeans that came through this area, which you'll, you'll see when we get into the actual lesson, um, it was the British who ruled making this subcontinent um, the jewel crown of its empire. So, um, I'm going to play y'all a short overview video of this country, and then we're going to get into uh, a little bit more of the specifics of the history and the culture. Hello friends, welcome to the exam based general awareness learning series. In this series of videos, we will be knowing the importance of culture and its brief overview. In the first session, we will be knowing the gist of everything. All of these topics may be covered in the upcoming videos. Comment which one you want to see first in the series of videos. 
In India, more than 1.3 billion people live. India is the land of many cultural living. Unity through diversity is the main attraction to India by many of the foreign countries. Like the United States, India is also a federal union where almost all of its states carries different languages, different cultural identities. Indian civilization is very ancient. The Indus Valley civilization was one of the first civilizations on earth. The Vedic period was a time in Indian history when the Hindu religion and caste system began in India. Mughal Empire was the lost and strongest Islamic empire in India. So because of this unity through diversity and different cultural identities only, India is known as a subcontinent within Asian continent. So here we see India in people, people with different clothing, people with different religions, people with different food habits, people with different celebrations. People living in different localities like urban, semi-urban, and rural. So this is how people uh, carry or live in different localities. So India is also mainly classified into four major sections, four major parts. The one is North India, uh, the major city in North India is New Delhi, and the Eastern India, the metropolitan city in Eastern India is Kolkata, Western India. Uh, the, Mumbai is the metropolitan city represents Western India and South India, Chennai represents South India as a metropolitan city. Uh, Indian people across the nation eat different foods as per their geographical availability. Like uh, North Indian people prefer to eat wheat and all, and uh, South Indian foods always carry rice. So, all over the India, vegetables are available. People take seafood, uh, meat also taken by these people, but however, cows are considered sacred by Hindus, many of whom are vegetarian. So all of India you can see masala spices, people drinking tea and coffee. And next we will see about religion. Religion in India is characterized by a diversity of religious beliefs and practices. The Indian subcontinent is the birthplace of four of the world's major religions, namely Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. Uh, with the people coming and settling from foreign, India is also now includes majority people living in India following Christianity and Islam also. Next, we will see about some major facts about the Indian important historical monuments. India is home to many historical monuments, uh, Mughals and the South Indian kings. And prior to that, that, those Hindu kings have built so many monuments across India. And the important ones to mention are Taj Mahal, Brahadishwara Temple in Tanjavur, Mysore Palace, Harmander Sahib, Ajanta Elora Caves, Mahabalipuram, Kajiraho, and the list is a long one. We will see all about these in a separate video. Next comes is music, traditional music of India. Hindustani and Carnatic are popularly known traditional music of India. Hindustani means classical music of North India. Carnatic means classical music of South India. Melody, drone, tala are some of the traditional elements of Hindu music. String, wind, percussion are some of the most commonly used instruments in Indian music. Next comes this dances, traditional dances of India. Dance is an ancient and celebrated cultural tradition in India. Folk dances abound all across the country, and huge crowds of people can be found dancing at festivals and weddings. Dance and song features heavily in Indian cinema also. So you can see the Mollywood, Kollywood, Bollywood, and everything you see songs that feature dances. Indian dance drives roots from six of the most important classical dance forms. They are Bharatanatyam, Kathakali, Kathak. Manipuri, Kuchipuri, Odissi. Again, we will see all about these things in separate video. There are many, many other cultural traditions that exist in India that everyone should know, especially those who are preparing for competition examinations. We will be seeing all these in our upcoming videos. Comment 
your favorite topic on all these things either you want dance as a first video you want uh, cultural traditions like music or historic monuments as a first video different kind of foods there are many many topics coming in this series hit the subscribe button to get the latest updates from the examining channel goodbye okay so from the video you can see that Indian culture is heavily influenced by uh, many different uh, groups of people that have ruled in this area over time and it is one of the most heavily populated countries in the world um, currently there are over 1.3 billion people living in this country. So it makes up roughly uh, 18 to 20% of the world population. So heavily populated, heavily influenced by many different groups who have moved in and out of this region over time. And uh, as a result, you have many different religions um, and all different types of culture influenced into um, this country. So all right, so Indian cuisine is about as easy to explain as rocket science because of all the influence that has uh, influenced this region in over 5,000 years. So regions and religions make up a large portion of the fabric of the food. So um, the reason I overview the culture and the religions is because the food is so heavily influenced by these things. So it um, like in the video you saw, the culture of India begins along the Indus River um, in farming communities in the southern lands of India. The history of India is punctuated by a constant integration and migration of people with different cultures. So. Um, India's social, economic, and cultural configurations are the products of this expansion and this migrating of different cultures. Um, so you heard in the video, they talked about pre-Vedic and the Vedic age. So Hinduism is one of the religions that arose in the Vedic period. Um, and there are several influences um, in the cuisine that are influenced by Hindu religion and also um, by Buddhism uh, and Jainism, which is another religion that is practiced. Um, so depending on, on the religions of these people are going to depend on their unique cooking methods, the spices that they use, the local ingredients that they use, and um, the cuisine is just as diverse as the people. So, um, so uh, Around 2000 BC and earlier, most people believe that the origins are um, as old as mankind itself. So the earlier formal civilization is the Mo in Jindaro and the Harapan civilization. Uh, most people believe that the Ayurvedic tradition of cooking, which is a holistic approach in cooking, evolved at this point in time. So your book does not really discuss a whole lot of the Ayurveda or the Ayurvedic cooking, 
but basically um, Ayurvedic cooking is um, the idea that the healing process and um, everything that you, you consume is in some way influential to your health. So, um, it played this Ayurveda or Ayurvedic tradition places great emphasis on prevention um, of health problems and encourages uh, the maintenance of your health. So, um, it plays close attention to the balance in your life, the right thinking, your diet, your lifestyle. And this is why you see a lot of spice used in Indian cuisine. So, um, spices uh, have been introduced by uh, many different cultures, but um, they all have, they all, it, it all depends on the religion as to which spices are the most prominent used in, in the different regions of India. So uh, the core balance uh, focuses on six tastes, sweet, sour, salty, pungent, bitter, and astringent. Um, and these tastes relate to the attributes of essence and effect. Kind of going back to that Aravita where um, what you consume affects your overall wellness. So around 1000 BC, we start to see the first movement of outsiders into India. Um, this forms the origins of the Indus Valley civilizations. The Mohenjo-Daro people are believed to have been pushed to the southern part of the country and the cuisine is still largely vegetarian. And this is where the beginning of Hinduism is shaped in this country. Um, also, the Vedas or the religious texts are developed. The caste system at this point in time dividing food habits of people broad, broadly by caste. For example, the Brahmins were the first, for the most part, were vegetarians, while the Khatriyas were non vegetarians. So uh, the caste system was basically just a system based on uh, the class distinction, basically from workers all the way up to uh, kings and nobles. So depending on which, uh, which class you were in, in this caste system could, could depend on what you consumed. So 600 BC, we see the emergence of Buddhism and Jainism. Um, Jainism has a marked influence on the cuisine in some parts of the countries, and Jains were strong believers in nonviolence. Um, traditional Jain cuisine, apart from being cooked without meat, was also cooked without onion and garlic. So they believe um, that some uh, roots and certain things that grow under the ground were not meant to be consumed, as well as um, meat was not meant to be consumed. So 400 BC parts of India were ruled by Alexander the Great, and in 326 period, but generally this period was the Mauryan dynasty. So the Mauryan dynasty um, or King Ashok was responsible for the further development of Buddhism. This period also saw uh, the, the development of Buddhism outside of India, which would lead people to people, but there must have been some kind of cross pollination with the food. So there are references to the development 
and production of several varieties of natural liquor that were consumed for recreation, and the Marian economy was also agriculture driven, which resulted in the base of all grain in Indian cuisine, which you'll see rice and lentils and certain different types of grains are, are staples in the Indian cuisine. So uh, around 80, 1280, this period was the period of several North Indian dynasties, including the Gupta dynasty. Um, the Gupta dynasty, um, which is mentioned in your book, um, was under a Hindu empire, um, but there is much evidence of Buddhism, um, and, and this can be uh, shown with different temples and statues that were built during this time. So during the region, uh, or during the reign of the Gupta monarchs, you had a flourishment of art and literature. Um, astronomy and mathematics were also major interest in this golden period of the Guptas. Um, there were several travelers who visited India and carried with them knowledge and products like tea and spices. Um, in the south of India, notable dynasties were the Vaisala dynasty, but from a culinary pers perspective, there are still no significant external influences brought into this country. So you still have um, um, local ingredients at this point in time. So around 1200 to 1580, this is the period of the Muslim invasions and the first entry of several foreign invaders into the country. Um, so a gradual decline in political leadership left the way open for invasion of uh, Babur, who was a Mongol descendant of Genghis Khan and created a powerful and culturally rich empire in northern India. This Mughal empire ruled much of India from 1524 all the way to 1707. And they were the, the uh, Mughal empire was responsible for uh, a building you may be or a palace you may be familiar with, which is the Taj Mahal. Um, and they had, there's many other artistic accomplishments during this area. Um, like, like this, like your PowerPoint sites, the, the religion of the Mughals was Muslim, but also Hinduism and Buddhism continued to flourish throughout India. Um, and gained strength after the fall of the Mughals. So, um, so after the fall of the Mughals, European influence began to be felt along the southeast coast. Portugal established trading posts, and the British, the British, Dutch, and French also began a vigorous trade during the 17th century. So. Uh, Vasco da Gama, which was a Portuguese explorer, arrived in India around 1948 to explore opportunities for trade, which later resulted in colonization by parts of the Portuguese. The most notable example of influence is seen in the cuisine of Goa in western India. Um, the Kilji dynasty ruled in northern India during a significant, significant period of time, and a meal time during this time might include the use of ghee, which is just clarified butter with the fats removed. Um, there were religions in India in this time that believed that the consumption of 
certain fats or fats from animal was not holistic. Um, but also you may see during this time, things like yogurts, pickles, and several courses uh, involving different different ingredients and, and things of that nature. So, um, so 1500 to 1800, this was the period of the Mughal Empire um, and the Mughalai cuisine that is people now associate with India. This includes the addition of several seasonings like saffron, additions of nuts, and cooking in the dome, or which is just a method of cooking with a sealed pot. In the south of India, you have the Sultan dynasty where the similar influences are permeated into the region. There's a con continuation of other European influences in parts of South India where you see the beginning of the Syrian cuisine. So 1800 to 1947 AD, this was a period of British rule and the love affair of the English with Indian food. This generally was hardly a glorified period in Indian history, but the British loved the general elaborate way of eating and adapted several of the food choices to their tastes and developed the curry as a simple spice to help them cook Indian spice or Indian foods. This period resulted in the emergence of the Anglo-Indian cuisine and the emergence of the certain Raj traditions like that of high tea, which is an elaborate late afternoon meal served with tea. Uh, so 1947 to 80, this is the post-independence period, which changed Indian cuisine to subcontinental cuisine. So this is kind of broke up into all these different regions of, of diverse cuisines. Um, the Indian landmass was divided into several countries, most notably Pakistan, Bangladesh, that inherited the following ancient history that has developed into today's culinary tradition. So, the landscape of this country is very varied. In the north, like we discussed earlier, you have many mountain ranges uh, where the Himalayas are located. Um, and there's many uh, other high Himalayan peaks other than Mount Everest that are more than 20,000 feet and are found along uh, this range that touches not only India, but also its northern neighbors of Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nepal, Bhutan, and Tibet. Tibet's highest terrain limits agriculture because of its limited rainfall. Um, other countries such as Bangladesh in the east are flooded by monsoons because of their low elevation. So you have um, a big uh, swing in not only landscape, but also climate depending on where you are in this country. Um, south of the Himalayas is a huge flat area through which the Ganges River flows. Um, and the Ganges and the Indus River were used heavily uh, throughout these periods of time for trade, but also there were many civilizations that developed along these river valleys because of the water source. So. South, southern India is an area of high flat land called the Deccan Plateau. So religion. Most people in India follow the Hindu religion. Hindus believe that Hindu gods and goddesses represent different qualities and powers of one supreme god. They have many festivals and celebrations and they believe that the place where any rivers meet is sacred. So this is going back to the Indus and the Congas, um, why these rivers are so important throughout these countries. Um, they also don't, aside from playing an important role with trade, 
um, and civilization, but they're also a part of their religion. Um, and they used to build platforms along these rivers called yats, which are um, built to enable people to bathe more easily in the Ganges River, and they're kind of just like platforms above the water. Um, food patterns. So Indian food is colorful and uses many spices. Indians eat different meals depending on what is grown in the area in which they live and their religion. Many Indians are vegetarians and Hindus do not eat beef and Muslims do not eat pork. Although knives and forks are used in India, eating with the fingers of your right hand is considered good man manners. You can uh, use your imagination as to why they only use their right hand to eat with. Um, so you're able to feel and appreciate the texture of the food. That is why they believe you should eat with your hands. So somebody made a comment. Yeah, so you, 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 like I said, you can use your imagination as to why they only eat with their right hand. So uh, one hand is designated for eating, the other hand is designated for something else. So um, before we get any further, I'm going to play you a video on um, Indian food, and I and I'm basically I just want to play. Uh, a section of this video so you can get familiar with some of the spices that are used in Indian cuisine. So you're welcome to go back and watch this entire video and I encourage you to to give you uh, further insight into some of the dishes in the cuisine, but we're not going to watch through all these dishes. We're just going to watch uh, the section on the spices. Spices fit into the cuisine. Spice is a part of our life. There is no spice, there's no life. They say spice of your life, literally means damn it, add a bit of cumin. <laughs> <laughs> Ajoy Joshi trained in India and has owned and cooked at a number of restaurants in Australia. Working with spices, he says, is like alchemy. So, what would you say would be the 10 or 12 key spices you'd need for the Indian cooking? Let's go to the most important ingredient when it comes to Indian food, and that's the chili. And we have two varieties here. There's one which is flat, and there's one which is curly and wrinkled. And this will give the color, this will give the pungency. Don't take the seed off. If you don't want the heat in the food, leave the chili whole. You get the flavors. If you want the heat or you want the pungency, break the chili so that you get the bite or the pungency into the oil. Look at this. It's called cassia. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon. Cassia is more of a robust spice. We use it for more of uh, savory dishes. Mm -hmm. Cinnamon is more for desserts. Coriander, look at this. This is the best. This is the most versatile spice. There is no spice mix or no masala that you get in the market which does not have coriander. It has, it's a binding agent, it's a filler, it's everything you name it. It can take the flavor of any spice. Actually, tell me about cardamom. Basically, two kinds of cardamom. One is black. Take a look at this, and the other one is green. Ah. Right? No relation to each other. This to me is a garam masala spice. Also used in making Indian sweets or desserts. This is smoked, it has a smoke flavor, an integral part of a dish called Roman dough. But garam masala must have green cardamom. Green cardamom and clove, um, along with cassia, are the three basic spices we use for making garam masala. And garam masala is? Garam literally meaning hot, not as in temperature or chilly but helps in breaking down the food, helps in digesting food. Wow, and I thought it was just the classic Indian spice mix. It's, uh, well, it's, it's a medicine little, it's, a little, it's a little more than that. Yeah. And most people think garam masala is something that you add towards the end of the cooking process. To me, garam masala can be added in the whole form at the beginning of a dish, towards the end, finish off with the garam masala in the powdered form. Cumin, which has to be there. Uh, it could be black or brown, prefer brown cumin. 
So they're, they're little seeds. Do you use them in seed form? Yes, so I, I prefer to use them in seed form. Use it in its mildly roasted form. Use it, um, make an aromatized oil or an infusion with, in hot oil. This is heaven. Black mustard. I mean, it has to be there. This adds character. It, adds, it brings life to dal, basically. As a potato. Ah. This is the real one. This is the powdered one. I have to be very true and honest. It's an anti flavor Oh, so you're not using this for flavor. You're using it to stop something else. Absolutely. I'm using this because when you eat a lot of dal and high-protein food, you know what happens. It uh -huh. can be embarrassing at times. Tuning. A pinch of this can lift a dish. You can take it to, I say, Andromeda Spain. Take it to the next level up. <laughs> Add this to a, a tomato sauce or a, or a spinach puree, and the color comes out dry. It's the best for antiseptic antibiotics. I need it with my son comes home with a cut here and a cut there every other day. Instead of, yes, we put turmeric. Women in India apply a paste of this in sandalwood. Oh. A turmeric for fertility, sandalwood for cleansing the body. You can imagine there are 1.2 billion people, they must have done something right. <laughs> <laughs> when Australians started traveling, we discovered the amazing variety and depth of flavor of Indian food. Perhaps because lamb is so popular, the northern Indian dish Rogan Josh is one of our favourites. Okay, so I'm going to stop the video right there. Y'all can y'all can continue to watch it further if you want to um, get an idea of some of the dishes that are Indian cuisine, but I mainly, mainly wanted you to see the variety of spices that they used and why they use a lot of these spices. And like you could see in the video, a lot of the spices they consume are for health benefits. So um, like he was saying, turmeric is a natural antiseptic. Um, and they even put like the asafoetida which it, it is a certain spice. They even use certain things for digestion in their food. So very holistic approaches to using spices, but also um, it goes back to that religion that affects why they eat certain things as well. So um, one thing that you heard, mentioned in that little short section of video was the garam masala. Um, garam meaning hot, masala meaning a mixture of spices is a blend of ground spices or it can be left whole like you saw at the beginning of a dish. Um, and this is basically just a, a mixture of spices that they add to a variety of different dishes it's kind of like the base spice of a dish. So, um, masala is the Hindi word for spice. When a combination of spices, herbs, and other condiments are ground together, it is also called masala. So, the composition of garam masala differs through, uh, depending on what region of India you're in. But with many recipes, um, across the Indian continent um, according to regional and personal taste and none is considered more authentic than any other. So the components of this mix are toasted and either left whole or then ground together. So typical version would include black and white peppercorns or just black peppercorns, cloves, cinnamon or cassia bark, which you saw uh, he had in the video, which he's described as a more robust um, spice, similar to cinnamon, but used more in savory dishes where the cinnamon is used more in, in sweet dishes. Also, mace, which is the outer covering of nutmeg, black and green cardamom pods, depending on the dish, they may use just green or just black. Black is going to have a more smoky flavor where the green is not. Also, curry leaf, cumin, coriander are also used. 
water, vinegar, yogurt, and other liquids are sometimes added to the ground spices. And this wet mixture is called wet masala. And they use the wet masala as a marinade um, on certain different types of meats. Or they saute it in oil before adding a main vegetable or a meat so that the flavors of the spices are released. A masala may be toasted before it is used to release flavors and aromas also. So, um, like I said earlier, depending on the dish, they may leave the masala in whole spice form, or they may grind it and add it at the end of the dish. Um, we are going to use, uh, we are going to make a garam masala mixture uh, in our dish that we're making this week, which is beef biryani. So beef biryani is basically a stir fry of onions, chili, garlic, ginger, um, along with the garam masala, um, some beef tenderloin, and a few other spices that are... Um, Basically, just like a stewed down beef mixture that is served over basmati rice. So that will be the dish that we make this week, and we're going to incorporate the garam masala spice into it. So a few other dishes in Indian cuisine and a few other ingredients that I want you to be familiar with. Um, lentils are going to be uh, the favored legume or bean in Indian cuisine. They appear in many different forms and they be they can be cooked and pureed with various spices um, or um, more commonly they're used in a dish called dal. Um, and it's basically just a puree of the lentils. Could also use chickpeas or kidney beans and it's just a stewed down dish um you saw it briefly in the video um that is typically served with rice one thing that indians are very keen on using is many different sauces and chutneys you always always almost always see a variety of different chutneys and comment uh, condiments and uh, dolls served with different meals, kind of as um, condiments to add to your dish or just to dip non bread in and eat. Um, ghee is going to be the most commonly used fat that is used in Indian dishes, which is basically just clarified butter that has been cooked down and the milk solids have been removed. Um, peanut and other oils are also used, um, and they're less costly than making ghee. Um, ghee is going to be a little bit more expensive to make. To make. So, um, the general name for breads in Indian cuisine is called roti. And there's uh, several different types of roti, um, such as naan, puri, chapati, paratha, um, and um, the, again, depending on the region and the type of cuisine, it's going to depend on the type of breads they use. But naan is going to be the, the most widely consumed bread in Indian cuisine and almost eaten with every meal. And this is baked in a clay pot oven known as a tandoor. Um, and it's basically a deep jar shaped oven where they build a charcoal fire in the bottom. And they will take these flatbreads and kind of stick them to the inside of the walls of these tandoors and allow them to bake. And it's a really... Um, quick cooking process and they also use the tandoors to cook 
uh, different skewered meats in. They'll basically put the meat on a skewer and just uh, put it down in the tandoor and let them roast. So you may have heard of tandoori chicken or tandoori beef. It, those are meats that have been skewered and cooked in these ovens. Um, also, a couple other spices, saffron, the world's most expensive spice, is bright yellow and considered a symbol of hospitality. You guys may remember using saffron when we covered Spain and Portugal. So this is going to be one of those spices that was fought, brought over by the Portuguese and integrated into Indian cuisine. Also, turmeric. A yellow spice that is used in curries is thought of to be lucky, but also uh, is consumed for many different health benefits. Red chilies, they're used in almost every type of curry, uh, curry in Indian cuisine. Um, and these are going to add the spice to all of your different curries. Ginger also is commonly used in curries. Um, and is also added to different types of tea. Uh, the most famous type of tea in India is going to be called chai tea, spelled C-H-A-I, and it is a heavily sweetened, um, has a thicker consistency similar to that of coffee or even I would almost even compare it to hot chocolate, but it is a sweet, heavily sweetened tea. Um, and they just take like little shots of it throughout the day, kind of like uh, Colombians drink their their uh, potent Colombian coffee. So um, mango is considered the king of fruits in India and is used in ice creams and a dish called kofi. Um, your book also discusses a few other types of dishes, um, one being samosas, which are popular, um, but they're basically just pastries that are tightly enclosed with a variety of different fillings and then deep fried. Um, also, basmati rice is in Authentic long grain white rice, which has a unique nutty flavor. Basmati is very popular in India and European countries. The tikka, which is skewered boneless meat cubes cooked in the tandoor, which I was just um, discussing. And uh, korma, which is a rich sauce thickened with yogurt, nuts, or poppy seeds. Uh, we, all, we already discussed the tandoor or the tandoori ovens. Again, this is the clay oven um, that charcoal is put in the bottom and then different items like the tikka, which is the skewer meat, and the naan are cooked in. So that is going to conclude your lecture for India. Um, like I said, we are going to uh, cook a classic Indian dish, beef birani. Um, which uses some curry garam masala um, in the recipe, and we are going to serve it with the basmati rice. Um, we are also going to make some naan bread as well. So um, I will probably, while you, while y'all are different, uh, broken up into your individual groups um or you're you're t really just working by yourself but while y'all are working by yourself in in the lab i'm gonna make 
a couple different condiments so that you can familiarize yourself with them and try them with your naan and your beef barani. Um, so that's going to conclude our lecture for today. And I will open this up to 